Nice to see so many, so many friendly faces in here, and I'm really glad to be here again with you today. Uh, my name is Victor Renta. I am from Romania. I am a Java champion, coding for almost 20 years, and for the past, for the last 10 years, I've been doing workshops and consultancy in various companies throughout Europe on topics like clean code architecture and testing. Um, uh, Spring Hibernate Web Flux Performance and Secure Coding. So this is what I do every day for many years already. And I get this amazing opportunity to talk to very, very smart people in many companies every day. So every week I work for one or two companies. It's both good and bad, but it's very intense, I can tell you that. Uh, you can find many of my talks on YouTube. I have a lot of talks, very educative. You can use them to make sure you are on track when you join a project, when many tech leads use these talks to give to the newcomers to the team to, get, to make sure they understand the, uh, the fundamentals. And I have a community that I'm very proud of. It's called European Software Crafters. It's the largest developer community in the world focusing on software craftsmanship. That means clean code architecture and unit testing. If you want to join, we meet every month, one hour after lunch, after, after work, completely free. It's also live streamed on YouTube, but it's more, more fun to join the Zoom meeting with 100 people you don't know and uh, have a debate with people throughout the, the world. It's very interesting, it's very intense. Hundreds of messages of chat discussions every time. It's super fun. And because there is life besides work, I have two children, a cat, and I'm trying to spend as much time as I can away from devices during weekends in the garden. All right, clean code, my favorite topic. Clean code is uh, doing one thing well. Clean code reads like a good story. You can say, you can tell if the author of the code did its best to write the best possible code, right? You can feel he tried his best. Clean code is when you open a method and you don't scream. Anyone screamed when you open the method implementation? Ah! You open the method implementation and you go, what the hell is there? That's not clean code, okay? Clean code does not shock you, okay? Anyone can write code that computer can, re can run, but very few developers can actually express their intention using the code. The point is today not to convince the machine to do what you want, but to uh, express your ideas, right? So the point is to, to, to tell the story. Now, before we continue, we have to see how we measure clean code. Anyone knows the unit of measure for clean code? No one dares to say it. Some of you know it. <gasps> no, you can't say it. It's the amount of bad words you emit when you code review some piece of code. Mind that even good code has its own share of dirty words, but if the code sucks... <laughs> Right. Um, a bit of history before we continue. Uh, 1999, the first book on refactoring and clean code was out. Then in 2008, the famous clean code book by Uncle Bob. And then 20 years after the first book, the second edition of refactoring came out several years ago. And I'm going to refer to this book again. Refactoring, second edition by Martin Fowler. Now, Things have changed. That's the purpose of the talk. 20 years ago, some things were not obvious. Nowadays, I don't think I have to tell you that you should not copy-paste code. I really don't think I need to tell you that. And I really believe, and I see in the groups, that they, I don't have to tell them that methods should be less than a screen long. That's, that's become part of the culture. I don't have to tell them that Boolean might end up breaking the single responsibility principle, accumulating too much logic in the same function. That became obvious, that comments should not be required but by clean code, that, that formatting should be the same for all the... and that immutability is here to stay. I don't have to explain people that, they know it already. Depending on the kind of company that I work with, some of them are really, really advanced already. So the point point of today is cover the fundamentals and then move on and see what are the rules we need to care about. But let's spend a fun moment here. Can you find five differences between the two pieces of the, the two images? Raise a hand if you can find one of them at least. Okay? More? Can you find more? Let's see. I'm going to give my shot here. The bush is missing. You see? Okay. The glasses. The hand. The grass. The, the, the what was left? The, the hair. Five differences. Congratulations, you found five differences between code you copy-pasted two years ago. 
And the next question is really what, what, what matters. Is it a bug or a feature, to quote the, to quote the gods of IT? Hey, it's a feature, or, it's a, or is it a bug? Is it okay that the bush was cut only in that part and not the other, or is it a mistake? Did someone forgot to cut it there, or should it only be cut over there? So you see, that's why, uh, how would you know? How would you know? Uh, the, you should try git blame, right? Git blame. Who the heck is the author? The author left the company, asked the business. They forgot. And that's what brings you to hell, because you can't possibly know whether that code should be changed or not. Welcome to hell. Don't repeat yourself goes the principle, okay? I didn't have to tell you that. You know already, if you copy-paste code, that you're going to burn, right? You know that. Yeah. But the fun thing that I ask the groups that I have, hey, where did you learn these things? How did you come to know these things? Who told you? Some people say that they can't even get to commit the garbage because the IDE is going to slap them. <laughs> Turn code yellow. Anyone had yellow code in IntelliJ or some editor of your own? Right? Code blinks yellow and say, what are you doing? This is stupid. You can do better, right? Or anyone, anyone tried to push garbage and then at commit, sonar kicked in and said, <clears throat> master, you are pushing shit on the remote. Are you sure? Right? You have tools that run in your editor and also after your commit on the pipeline, checking that your code quality stays good, right? But the best source, what I've seen, what I've heard, the best source, who, who here remembers one particular code review they got from someone in their career, which changed their life in a way, like, whoa, that code review is like, eyes opening, right? That's what, where the magic really, hap really happens, when a human tells you, right? Right. And who here has uh, to go through a mandatory code review to get the code approved? Who here has a mandatory code review step, a pull request review step? I see almost half of you. Who here has two reviewers? I mean, like, you're the author, one more guy, and a third guy looking at the same code. Okay, that's like 30% of you. Fantastic, right? Now, better than code review is pair programming, of course. I mean, like, you spend quality time, just you and the code and the pair program, together, writing code. 10 minutes you, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Beautiful. Nothing beats that. Super fast learning, super fast feedback, more engaging. It, it's, a, it's an emotional involvement from both parties, right? Some people mention books. Okay, if you are a book fan, for, for sure you have to read the clean code book, at least the first half. And my own, my own story was I, 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 I watched the clean coders videos from Uncle Bob. Back in those days, 10 years ago, that was what got me, uh, the God, what got me addicted of clean code. Those videos and the way he talks about clean code is like, absolutely fascinating. And now if you want to really master your stuff, you want to do some exercises, some practice. Who here has ever done a refactoring kata? Taking some shitty code online and try to refactor to the best it can. They can. Very good. Like, what? Ten of, you, ten of you. Congratulations. Now, of course, that's only if you care. Don't test your code. Ask someone. It works, so why refactor? Carpe diem, baby, right? I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production. <laughs> Some, uh, that guy that copies five fixes from Stack Overflow doesn't know which one fixed the problem, but it works. <laughs> Let's push it. Right? That guy, that guy, that guy. I won't talk more about this guy. This is, this is disease. For the, but if you don't care about clean code, your, your code is going to end up like this. Right? With, 20, with 12 Boolean parameters, ifs that span hundreds of lines, desperate comments, null checks everywhere, to-dos that never has the courage or energy or brains to fix, and of course the feeling that you are overwhelmed by the fear by changing it. That will be the end of your creativity. You're going to run for your life saying, you can't touch this. Can't touch this. Put your hands off. You can't touch this. Can't touch it. 
and you're going to patch over your life just to get the job done. Sounds familiar? So, the same way that medics take a note not to harm another human being, you should take a note that you should not ship shit. That you should only push with reliable tests. And I, I had a discussion two weeks ago. That's why I put the slide here. Because some group really asked me, Victor, but what if they don't give us time to refactor? What do you mean they don't give us time to refactor? No one should know. It is your task. You stand up straight, you practice this, and you say, my task is not done. It works, but it's shitty inside. You say, not done. Repeat after me. Not done done. I was stupid. I was, did not meet the deadline. I am not done. It works, the button. But it's so shitty and so untested that you just deleted the button from the screen five minutes before the demo. I'm not kidding you. I did this twice in my life. You just drop the feature, pretend it's not done because you did not have time to, to refactor. and to, You're not proud of how it looks. It's just garbage. Right? That should be the baseline. That should be the default behavior. Okay? Now, in this journey that we are talking here about, in which you start from faculty and then you go towards uh, professional code, you have to understand code smells. Code smells are those things, those little, you know, ever went to some code and had this feeling something stinks, but you could not say what it stinks at that moment? That, what the hell is wrong with this code? Something is fishy. I had that instinct, gut feeling. What? But you could not name it, right? The first thing you want to do in your professional career is to understand the little design, ins the little design things that you can run into. And the rule is, goes like, if something stinks, you have to change it, whether it's code or your baby. Okay? So you have to change it. Now, these code smells are little design issues that you that you came into, and you draw the conclusion that if you don't fix it, it will hurt you, all right? And you have to address those little code smells. Now, there is the first set of code smells that you run into. <laughs> the um, things that start off very innocent, like that duck over there, and grew humongous, right? And in this chapter goes mo go monster methods, goat classes, and large signatures. These are things which start off innocent and small, and they accumulate, right? Breaking single responsibility principle. So, I mean, basically breaking the idea that code should do one thing, okay? Now, with methods, we discussed that methods should be less than a screen, but if you say that to developers, they buy projectors and rotate monitors. That's not the point. Like, 20 lines is a good number, <laughs> but... <laughs> But it's not about the number, right? It's about the complexity inside. The more complexity you, f you have inside, the shorter you should make your method to explain your, your ideas, right? Use method names to document your intention. That's fundamental. Arguably the most important rule of clean code. You have a chunk of code that does something that you can name, extract. Extract a method, right? Good. Now, that's about the length, but what actually hurts us more today in the code I see in projects with lambdas. Anyone had a lambda inside another lambda? A lambda in a lambda? Anyone had lambda in lambda in lambda? <laughs> He's still with me. Right. Deeply nested code is what kills us. If you have boring linear code with no tabs, no indentation, it's child play to cut it into pieces. Right? Everyone can do that. It's boring. You just grab code, extract method, done. Right? The real game is when you have a function like this. What the heck do you do with it? Right? How do you handle that? That's a function that requires respect. This function, and the problem is that changes usually happen in the depth of that third lambda of yours. In the depth of very... It's very hard to get it out of there. So um, the good news is that tools today can catch these things, and they will tell you, <coughs> master, you are pushing shit. Right? So it's very hard, really, to get this code checked in today. I hope. But there, is some, there are some ideas I want to share with you. If, if you have an if, and the else branch is extremely anemic, and maybe returns or throws, what you can do is a very boring refactoring. You flip the if. It's called guard, guard clause. You do something like this. If param equals null, throw or return. 
Stupid example, but you get the point, right? If you have a NIF, however, which is superficial at the baseline, and then behind that if there is one heavy thing there, another heavy thing there, you could think of breaking the function into two functions. One for the true-false, one, the one for the false case, right? Loops, for loops. I'm going to preserve this, the, the discussion for a while. Switches. Should, switches should not have anything before or after in that function, and every case should be one line long. That's a good switch, right? Catches. Who the heck does catches anymore? Why would you catch? What to, to catch to do what? Like, you're catching to what? To do a retry? Wow, didn't you hear of a retriable? To do what in the catch? Well, what we do usually, we just throw the exception to the boundary of our system, convert it for the user, 500 internal error. And you let it fly. You don't have to catch it. Okay? It's an aberrant, absurd, fatal condition. Let it fly. Good. So methods which are deep or long, usually do more things. We make sure that are very weird and complex deserve their own function, right? And if you can find a good name for the function, extract it. Lambdas. Lambdas in which you put five lines of code. Okay? You start a lambda, and you start pouring, 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 pouring. Uh, maybe you even open a brace. Brace yourselves. And there goes code. No, never. Extract a function. Give it a name. What are you doing in there, right? These are the, the problems we are, we are fighting today. Right? Lambda, yeehaw. Classes. I want to share with you a slide that one of my trainees, you know, I have groups of, I have groups that have three years of experience, five years of experience. I have groups that have 15 years of experience in average. Can you imagine talking to a group that has 15 years of experience in average? I shit myself. What can, I what can I tell those guys? They have 20 years, 23, 17, 12 years. Who am I? And I asked them to present us some code smells. This is a slide they came up with. A class with too much code is a prime breeding ground for a duplicated code, chaos, and death. Beautiful. We were, and with theatric interpretation, we were, went goosebumps, right? Yeah, right? That's from refactoring, that's from a book, right? A, cl a class which is big, which is over 200, 150, definitely hides more responsibilities. Definitely does things on different layers of abstraction, both orchestration and low-level details. Or maybe you would pile up different behaviors in the same unrelated class. So just put this, shovel everything inside. Ever heard of the customer service? The user service? The, put there, it's space. Huh? Break the class. Break the class. Parameters. If you have more than four, something stinks. You may be able to derive one of the arguments from another one. You could do that. Or you could, you could conclude that the function is trying to do too many things and you need to cut the function into pieces. Right? But sometimes you find three arguments moving hand in hand in four classes, in four places, moving together. Those three or four fields are always together, moving hand in hand through your code, in which case you can introduce a new type to represent them. And that's the first code smell that you play from an object-oriented perspective. It's, the, um, it's some, a pile of data that moves through your code. And I can't tell you how frequent this is. Extremely often, you find groups of data that just moves through your system without you acknowledging that that's actually a class. You could pile it together and give it a name. It could be an address. It could be a... Anyone has tuples in their code base? Tuples? Tuple? Tuple 4? Anyone? Tuple 7? Tuple 7? Tuple 14? No, I'm kidding. Tuple 7 is the max I ever saw. Tuples are a degenerate construct that just groups together some random values, right? It's the same as an array in PHP or, a, or this in JavaScript. It's a destructured construct that has stuff. You don't know what stuff. It's just there, right? But the obvious advice is to create classes, types that have names, that mean stuff, not just pass an array right? or a hash map. Oh, let's pass a hash map. What keys that are inside? We don't know. What the hell of a game is this, right? 
I want a, a, a meaningful name with attribute names and everything. Good. And once you discover a new class, you can use that class to simplify signatures, to add behavior to it, maybe even make it valid through constructor. And you can go as far as simplifying your entities by saying, I don't have these three fields anymore. I have a single field called address. Make sense? OK. So these are called value objects. The, the, the classic example is the money class, the money with the mounting currency. Right? The money is a value object, it's a small immutable object that doesn't have identity. It's just a, some grouping of data. This amount and this currency means the money. Right? It doesn't have a primary key. And if you want to compare two money objects, you could just compare them field by field. It's just, if you play record, it's done. If you play at data or at value, actually at value from Lombok, you're done. Right. Nice. Now, in the same object-oriented world, if you see code looking like this, an object-oriented, uh, the object-oriented paradigm says, what are we doing here? Why do we have behavior operating on the state of the player? Look. Player, get place. Hey, but if the place is over 12, then decrease 12 and put back the place. You see? This kind of code is a code smell called feature envy. This logic can be moved inside the player. You see my point? Like this. This is object-oriented programming at work. You can do object-oriented programming at work to keep behavior next to state. Right? It's much easier to reason about stuff like this. Data classes. Hand in hand with this comes the old principle that you should, we should not mix behavior with state. Whoever heard this, that the data structures should only have data? Fun, fun. Uh, that's actually wrong. If you read a bit around, if you go into domain-driven design ideas, you will find that in the contrary, you need to put bits of behavior in to spice up your data with bits of behavior that could guard some invariants, some rules of your domain, or maybe protect you from, from stepping on a null, right, by returning an option or something. Structures that help you, not just getters and setters, right? In the, same star, in the same world of object-oriented programming, there is one more game to play. Ever, ever, <laughs> look, imagine you have such a function that takes a long coupon and a long customer. And imagine someone calls the method mixing up the arguments, passing the longs incorrectly. You see the point? It can mess up the semantics of what that long meant. It can pass the coupon as a customer. We actually had that, and the, the shocking news is that it worked. It linked in completely wild, backwards things. It scrambled our database in two days. We couldn't understand the thing from the database anymore. Right? Or this beautiful map long to list of long, beautiful, called map. God help us all, what does the key mean? What does that second long mean? We don't have the faintest clue. If the variable name is, is longer, we have a chance. Otherwise, we are dead, right? So in this kind of game, the problem is the long and strings don't mean anything. What we can do instead, it's a bit shocking, but we could create classes that keep a single value inside. I would just, yeah, one long, one field inside. This is outrageous for many of us, like what? A class with one single, are you nuts? Why would you do that? You can't possibly mix up the customer ID with coupon ID anymore. It will not compile. Make sense? It will not compile. And the map below, it's just beautiful. Look, it's map of customer to list of done, right? It's absolutely beautiful. Now, there is some problem with memory in Java. Even in Java 21, there is a problem with until Project Valhalla is out. This can eat a bit of memory. But I would recommend you do this if you have some very important IDs in a train environment, in a train business, station ID, in a business with telecommunications, satellite ID, customer ID for a bank, things that you group stuff by, account ID, IBAN, IBAN, huh? the, 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 the IBAN of the bank, stuff that you, is, is critical for your business that you use to group things by.
some people see OOP like this, and it was in some 20, 2005, 2010, there was this abundance of object orient abuse of object orientation. This is, but with what's cool today, functional programming, functional programming, of course. Gangnam style. Ha! Good. Now, with functional programming, the cool thing about that, if you look, if you Google this up, they will tell you uh, functions are first-class citizens. At which point you could ask, what the heck is that? Here's the example. You can directly pass the behavior to a function without having to instantiate an interface and pass it along. Anyone did that in their life before? New interface implementation, row mapper, action handler, action handler. Excellent. It's gross. Just gross. If it's so much easier to use uh, the lambda, the functional programming sugar, right, to pass just the behavior, right, and this changed the way we work with collections because they allow us to tweak the collections without ever changing them. If you want to derive a collection from an old one, you stream filter map to list, done, without mutating collections. Okay, and then you run into this code. Let's read it together. It's a function taking throwing consumer and returning another function, lambda in, lambda out. And then this code. Can you tell me what this code is doing? What happens here? Look how much time it takes. Come on, come on, come on, come on. This is Java code, the simplest kind of code I could write for this concept. What does it do? It takes a method that throws a checked exception and... Perfect. It throws a method that, check, that, throws, a, that throws a checked exception and allows you to use as a lambda somewhere else because it re-throws the checked exceptions as runtime exceptions. But someone with, what, 15 years of experience or more was able to tell that. But like, there was an awkward 10-second silence in the room in which the only sound was scratching. What the hell is this? This is a higher-order function. A function returning a function kills the brain of developers. It just proved you. It took you so long to read a five-lines-long function. A function that returns a function shuts down a developer if, it's, if, if the language is not a purely functional language one. If you throw this function to a Haskell, Kotlin, Scala developer, they're going to say, yeah, of course. For Java, it's killing, right? It's very hard to reason about functions that return functions, hard to debug, hard to break point, hard to, hard to maintain. So my advice is against these. They are hard to, to digest, right? Try, try to avoid it. There are cases in which you have to do this. Once every three years. Don't do it every month with the high because I can. Step aside, boy, I'm going to return a function. Shh, shh, don't do that. Good. Now, the real functional programming philosophy talks about objects and functions. Now, let's fill the gaps. What should be here? What should be here? Objects should be how? Functions should be how? What does functional programming tell you to do? Come on, everyone uses functional programming. Objects should be how? Immutable, exactly. And how should functions be? Pure. Let me put the song that we all love. No side effects. No changes in the world. Nothing changes. Just computing. And if you pass the same input, it returns the same output. Beautiful. Beautiful. Beautiful functions. Again, from one of my trainees, the best definition of functional programming, functional programming is programming without side effects. Boom. <laughs> so you should not change stuff. You should not change stuff. But then, 
Now, you should not change stuff because if you have an object that has a, a mutable state with setters, please think setters, right? If you have an object with setters and you pass it along a flow that has 20 lines of business logic, you are looking for trouble. Someone in that corner of that logic in that long dark night debugging an issue, it's going to do a stupid thing. It's going to change a field because you passed a mutable object in. Or if you play multi-threading, oh, if you play multi-threading. <laughs> multi-threading access to mutable data, beautiful. It's called race bug. And people lose their innocence when they have their first race bug. You become, you are no longer a child when you have your first race bug. The point is immutable objects, but the first trap we fall in next is that we make immutable objects have 12 fields. Wrong. An object, an immutable object which is very large is going to force you to recreate and clone it repeatedly. It's going to burn memory a lot. So the next thing to keep in mind is that immutable objects should be shorter, smaller than the mutable version. Should be a bit smaller. I don't know, five, seven fields smaller, right? Not 23 fields. That's <laughs> Not going to work. All right. How much does it hurt when a limb is cut off by a lightsaber compared by a regular blade? Question on Reddit. Oh, it should hurt much less because the plasma immediately cauterizes the wound. What's the connection? Well, now you have functional programming. We have streams. Hiya! And you use streams because streams, is, streams are cool, right? Folks, anyone here not Java? Not Java? Right? The not Java guys in the front end, you, you, you have an array, dot, map, or filter directly, right? Like doing construct to change the collection. That's what I call stream. Filter, let's do this. And then you have to sum up all the order amount. The next thing you do, you fall back to high school. For each order arrow, sum plus equal. Now, with the exception of the five friends in the room, the rest of you can't compile this. Because in Java, it's a, there's a thing called effectively final that stops you from changing local variables from lambdas. You cannot change local variables from lambda. And because the language doesn't help you, you take shortcuts. Atomic integer. What the heck is that? Int array. Can you read that? <laughs> What are these? These are bad ways to keep changing stuff. Bad ways to keep changing stuff. Because the change now works because you moved the stuff you change on the heap, not on the stack anymore. It's new, you see? New. It's, a, it's an object that you are changing over there, not a local variable. But that's just... You didn't get the point. The point is don't change. You, we are still changing. Plus equal, plus equal increment. You see? You didn't get the point. The point is don't change. It took IntelliJ five years to add, to add the fix. Avoid mutation using streams soon. In those five years, people were hitting Alt Enter and doing this. Do you know what Alt Enter does? Alt Enter, quick fix. So the point is here not to change state. The point is to compute and return. Assign a variable, don't change collections and, and numbers. Make sense? Right? The same philosophy, compute and return. That's functional programming. In the same spirit, I'm increasing the heat a bit here. We are talking about more advanced design principles today. More advanced clean code guidelines. Stuff that 20 years ago no one talked about. Stream for each. Stream for each and optional if present are code smells. Wow. Are code smells if you can avoid them? Are code smells if you do in a for each put? What is put doing? Put is changing state. Ah! Other increment, that's a change. At least not add, these are changes. If you do in a for each or an if present some, ch some changes to state, don't. Instead, use these other, other options. Seek for other ways, OK? Now, of course, I can't completely burn for each and if present. There are occasions in which you could do this. 
By the way, the slides are already on the internet. If you search me on Twitter, on X, you can find X. You can find the link to the slides already on, on the, over there. It's okay to use for each and if present if you want to send some side effects outside the system over a queue or a rep or something, but not to change state in memory. Okay? All right. Okay. That could make sense. That could. Some of you might not. What? But for many of you, it may it may click. Okay. Oh. You should see the face of my daughter when she did her first loop in Scratch. It was, who has children here? Few of you, I guess. Uh, those of you with children, Scratch is the first language that your children is go are going to learn. Please don't ask your daughter to learn C++. And my daughter did her first loop. She was like in tears. Look, look, I can create, I, I can do the software, I can do the program, do re plant some grass everywhere. It's like the power, exactly. Remember the power? The power we, we felt when we first learned about the four? Bad news, four years ago, four was labeled to be code smell. Boom. At this particular moment in time and space, someone in the back who didn't have enough coffee is thinking, oh, I'm safe, I'm using while. No, <laughs> no, it's about the loop, the idea to repeat something over and over with a four, imperatively traversing a collection, next, 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 E plus plus, that kind of, right? Loops are bad in the, co in the, co in the book, chapter three, what stinks in code? Loops. Now, I can't go as far as they go, but I will agree that a four that starts doing a lot of things breaks single responsibility principle. In which case, you need to look at it and start finding ways to break it. <laughs> what, three-fourths? Are you nuts? Ah! Oh my god! Let's put the oh my god in the pocket for one minute. And let's see what happens next. If you break the four in three pieces, you will run in a four that has just above it an empty collection. When I go to codebase, in my clean code training in the, work, in the workshops, in the companies, I, usually, I always requ request uh, code samples from production. And uh, when I see a collection created just above a four and it's empty, I don't even have to read below. I know exactly what's going to happen. They are going to add to that collection. That's called an accumulator loop. You accumulate results in a collection or a number, total. When that happens, collect. Make sense? Functional pipeline. Produce the value in one declarative pipeline and live la vida loca. I mean, like, much easier. Pam, pam, pam. Right? You could stick with the four or go to, with the four each, but the ones above become code smells. These are code smells. And I have clients in Belgium, in Netherlands, in Romania, if they see at the code review a four, they go like, hmm, a four in our code base. Hmm. They will reject the pull request. What do you mean four? We did four 10 years ago. <laughs> Imagine joining that team. Imagine getting your fourth code review, and in the pull request it says, four is a code smell. I hope. I hope, that's why I'm telling you about this, not to be sh shocked when you first hear this. Four is a code smell, right? Now, let's take from our pocket ah! the screen. Some of you are still thinking, are you really breaking a four in three? Oh my God, how about performance? That's what most groups ask first, <gasps> performance. Do you remember the O-N notation? O n square, O n log n. Somehow it's burned inside our education that smart developers write highly efficient code. Somehow we are afraid of doing a for loop. Well, folks, let me be very clear. If I would put the for inside the other for, that would be a stupid thing to do. We would blow up complexity. 
But if I'm putting in one next to the other, it's the same temporal asymptotic complexity. If you think a bit. But we are still afraid of looping twice. Now, people ask me next, hey, how many elements are in the list? If there are few, I don't give a shit. If there are one million, if there are one million, I'll ask them back, where, that, where did that million come from? And they tell me, over the network. From a database. No shit. How much time it took you to bring over the network one million rows? <gasps> Under a minute. Do you think looping twice in memory over one million elements can be compared to a minute of time? <laughs> what are we comparing over here? The relative impact is zero, be neglectable, right? But in the, in the room, I, I guess there are two or three developers right here who are building this highly frequency system which have a response time of 10 milliseconds. Can you imagine a system who, that responds in less than 10 milliseconds? Can you, can you do, how, how could you do that? <laughs> here, 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 Sparta. This is, ins how can you do this response time? The only idea is to somehow from memory orchestrate a hash map and some hazel cast madness to yeehaw. Right? Those guys could have an issue with repeating a four. If you're talking about milliseconds and millions of rows, they could have a, not the rest of you. Besides the three guys here, don't care. Right? But do your own benchmark. Do your own benchmark. Start with my project and do your own experiment to see how much time you actually lose. Those guys of you, I hope you know what GMH is. Java measuring hardness. The only way to prove for with micro benchmarks that some code runs faster than the other. It's the code that will prove you that a for each and a regular for is the same efficiency. Very fun things. Okay. Good. Now, what really you should be concerned of, not the performance, but the order of the operations. Initially, you were doing operation one for both elements, uh, operation one and two for first element. Okay, this thing could be too hard for, it's too early in the morning. Never mind. Right? Just be careful with the order of the operation. And also be careful if you have any return or throw in here, some, or break or continue. You know, there is a famous joke, Venkat. Uh, who knows Venkat? Venkat. Venkat Subramaniam, arguably the best speaker in the world. Venkat has this, this moment in a workshop of his. He was teaching functional programming, and some, uh, someone in the group asked, after one and a half hour of speaking, hey, is there any break? And Venkat famously answered in functional programming, we don't have break. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, this joke could be too, maybe it's too early for this joke, but the point is the next thing you want to show to the world is that you master functional programming and you write this. But you forget, we forget, you forget, you forget that we know where you live. I'm here for a code review and I brought a friend. <laughs> so don't harm your colleagues. Stop the madness after several operators and explain what you did with variables and functions, right? Extract some things and name the thing. Make sense? Right. Now, who of you here is using Kotlin? Scala? Aha! Uh -huh. Kotlin. <laughs> In Kotlin and Scala, in functional languages, in modern languages, languages built 10 years ago, not 29 years ago, it is a good practice to have your functions be equal to an expression. If I wrote this in Kotlin, I would start saying f equals, the function can be equal an expression. It's called expression functions. And this is clean code in a purely functional language. Functions that only compute a value. The Java equivalent of that. Now, I actually had to go to Scala for three months for some client. I stayed in Scala for three months. When I came back to Java, after two weeks of depression and drinking a lot of palinka, when I actually got in my senses and, and okay, okay, I'm back to Java, okay. Okay, then I, it struck me that the principles that we followed in designing code in Scala and Kotlin is telling us 
to create super time. And the next thing I do in Java, I do functions that start with the return statement. This is the equivalent in Java. This is the best Java can do, still, for now, right? Okay? So functions should just compute a value. That's the, that's the main idea. Anyone here using reactive programming? Web flux, re observables, monoflux? My condolences to the whole team. In reactive programming, this is the way to do it. The only way to do it. The only correct way to do it. That's why reactive programming is so, that's why reactive programming is so fun to use. Don't read this, it's too early for reactive chains. Just, that's the mandatory way to work. That's why some people would like the reactive programming to burn in hell. That's why some people are so glad because virtual threads in Java 21. Death to reactive programming, they say. I can't just, can't just heal a paradigm, but this is insane and it should, and should be insane. This compiles in Java 21, experimental feature, string interpolation. We've waited this for 20 years. You see? If you put a dollar before, sounds like JavaScript. Anyway, right, so confused variable. You have a variable, you assign average equals to zero, and you add to the average the salary of every employee. At line number five, the variable name lies to us. Do you see? It means sum. It's not average yet. What should we do here? Create another variable. Make a sum variable. You see the point? At line number five, the average is not average yet. It's only sum. So create another variable called sum, and then compute the average later. This means that variable, I'm trying to say that variables in a function should mean one thing only. And if you want to go pro, don't reassign local variables. Okay? Don't reassign variables ever. Okay? <laughs> ever run into dead code? Dead code? The discussion here can take even an hour, just on this slide, to define what dead code really is. Dead code, the simplest thing you can find is uh, things that turn gray in your editor, a parameter which is never called, a function which is never called. Right? That thing, you just alt, enter, delete. Boring. Easy. Right? Alt, enter. You know the poem, don't you? Let me... Alt, enter. There. If it's red, yellow, blue, or gray, alt enter will save your day. And if you are not using IntelliJ, why? Why aren't you? Anyway, this is the best editor on the planet, so what the heck are you? The code only tells, um, um, okay, commented code. Ever, ever looked at commented code? Like, <sighs> wipe it out. Put it on a branch. But then came a client of mine, I can't tell you more, which, co which code base was full of if BF. Can you guess what BF stands for? Black Friday. <laughs> and now you know the client. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the code was full of ifs, BF. And I was like, what is BF? And they said, we don't know what BF is. And they, no. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and for Black Friday, they toggle it to true, right? 30% 30, 30 of the checkout flow changes. Not reachable. Not reachable. This is ugly. There could be endpoints that you never go to. You see, ever had that? Endpoints that no one used for many, many, many months, maybe years, right? You should have a tool in place to, to monitor what endpoints are still called, right? But the real game is here. Code branch, which is impossible to reach. Like this. You think it's impossible to reach. This is the, the real game. Would you dare to delete this if completely? <laughs> My friend. Maybe you can use some Kung Fu profilers or coverage tools to find if you ever go that path. But the real solution here is to ask the author as soon as possible. Git blame, ask the author. You may be lucky. 
He may say, yeah, sure, I just forgot. Thank you, Victor. Delete it, please. If you ask six months later, the only thing that you're going to hear is, you can't touch this. You can't touch this. It's I'm kidding. So, um, the other idea in the, same, in the same place is that when you copy-paste from Stack Overflow, please don't let all the ideas you copied from Stack Overflow. Right? Did you ever copy the three or four solutions desperately from Stack Overflow? Perhaps one of them works. It's called the Stack Overflow Rampage. After you go in the Rampage, you clean up the unused solutions. You try to figure out the least minimum change to fix the issue. Make sense what I'm saying? It may take more to find out which is not used than copy-pasting from... Anyway, just leave the minimum amount of code you need. Have you ever wrote code hoping, hoping for a feature that will come tomorrow, or hoping that your code will become the next big library that everyone are going to use? This is pride. It's called P-R-I-D-E, pride. The capital sin, right? Pride. Uh, anyone, anyone wrote code that hoping for a new requirement or, or hoping it will become the next library? Fun. All the good developers do it. Tend to think in advance is not wrong. The problem is what you do when you realize that future never happens. Do you delete the code or you leave it like that? It's called over-engineering. Who here is guilty of charged of over-engineering? Come on, be honest. Ah, there you go, like what, 20% of you, right? It's natural to do that. The problem is when you don't... There are multiple things here to note. You could just want to play. Don't play in production. Or you could be afraid that you won't have the skills to change the code later. Have faith in you and your colleagues. You can adapt to the changes. There is nothing come more hard than finding a simple solution to a complex problem. Da Vinci. How can you argue with Da Vinci? Right? Anyway, what the, oh, 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 one last slide. Some languages are made in 1995. I mean, like, what, 18, 28 years ago? It's a long time ago. Who here has less than 20 years old? Less than 20 years old. You are the only one having less than 20 years old? I'm, I don't think so. Hmm. Okay, so uh, getters and setters, that's the first thing that shocks you when you come to Java. What's with all this garbage? Thanks, Lombok. So who here uses Lombok? Lombok, 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 like half, the, or more than half of you. Nice. Checked exceptions are a mistake. Only throw runtime. Null. They patched it later with optional. They tried to do their best. S collections that can be, they can be changed. It was a mistake in 1995, but back in those days, it, Java did an amazing job compared to C++. Right? So, it was an extremely good job, but then they realized, hey, we want to make them unmodifiable. Immutable list from Guava, list over to list. They are trying to patch over their, that, that mistake and try to promote more immutable collections with years. Okay? What did we cover? Unfortunately, my time slot is kind of out, so we covered methods which are too long. Lambdas, classes too long, too many parameters. Data that just moves around without having a good name, make a class. Feature envy, which is logic staying outside of the class that it operates on. Classes with only getters and setters. Long strings everywhere. I see longs, strings everywhere. Only longs and strings. Long, strings, long, long. At some point, it could be gross. Right? Complex loops, accumulator loops that just pile up stuff in a collection. You use streams, but you do plus equal and you change state. Stream rec, filter, filter, map, filter, filter, map, map, filter. Relax, man. Unless the five fellows in here, my condolences. Mutable data and confused variables, that could an over engineering, but this is not the end. Now, what I would love to hear from you that, that you did is that you actually scheduled the meeting next Friday with your team. 
It's no longer called mob programming, it's now ensemble programming. We sit together and we live code on some kata or on some production code together, trying to do our best to answer that, those questions at the top. What's weird about the code? How to fix? What do we lose if we fix? And do we want to fix it in our production code or not? Play this game. Right? Try to find out. To, to, to agree with each other, to find, to learn tricks from one another, and slowly go towards more mastery of this clean code thing. The books you have to, you have to. You could read to increase your, your skills in that regard. And with that, I thank you all, and I wish you a great conference, and join the community if you like. All right? Great, thank you. If you have any questions, we can take them afterwards. My time is out.